let's take a trip down the rabbit hole and try and figure out how to make Alice in Dungeons and Dragons. Welcome to D&D Builds, where we have an outlet to make all sorts of ridiculous Dungeons and Dragons builds and stop driving the people in our lives insane with them. Today, we're going through the looking glass and trying to build out Alice. She pops up in a lot of different mediums, so we're gonna find a nice balance between all of them at least most of the major ones. Whether it's Disney's Alice in Wonderland, or American McGee's Alice, or Alice Madness Returns, or even some of the other random variations that have popped up, even the Tim Burton movie. And if you stick around till the end, I'll give you a little glimpse as to who I think is the very best portrayal of the Mad Hatter. While Alice is surrounded by tons and tons of chaos and crazy creatures, she herself is a fairly normal human, so we're just gonna grab the human variant race. When you choose the human variant race, you get to choose a feat, and the feat I like best for Alice is Dungeon Delver. It has a few perks about dealing with traps, which can be pretty helpful when going through the very treacherous world of Wonderland, but I think what really drew me to this feat for Alice is that it gives you advantage on perception and investigation checks, at least when you're trying to use those checks to detect the presence of secret doors. And that seems very fitting for pretty much any depiction of Alice when it comes to her navigating Wonderland. As far as a background, Background, I would choose Far Traveler because it is a hell of a long journey either through the looking glass or down that rabbit hole. This gives you skill proficiencies in insight and perception, and you get to choose a feature for why are you here, and I would just choose Wanderer because you just kind of stumbled upon this place. Then you get an additional skill from being a human, and I would just choose Deception, because sometimes you have to try and hide your true intentions. With the background and race sorted out, let's just dive straight into some stats. Alice has a very slight build, so we're gonna go with an eight on strength, just completely dumping it. As in the video games, she does dash around quite a bit and is fairly nimble. I would go ahead and throw 15 into dexterity and then get another plus one from our human variant. Then to make sure that we don't just outright die making our way through Wonderland, we're gonna at least put 14 into constitution. Intelligence, we're gonna dump down to eight because this is a little bit more about the madness, not really about being smart. We'll make wisdom a baseline of 10, just so that way you can at least maintain your sanity a little longer. And then we're gonna bump charisma because it seems as though everybody in Wonderland is very enamored with Alice. So we're gonna take that, bump it to 15, and then get another plus one from our human variant. Now, obviously we have a ton of points into charisma, so there's only three main classes that really utilize that quite a bit. And we're gonna ignore the paladin because you don't have enough strength to really play off Paladin very well. So we have Bard, Warlock, and Sorcerer. Bard doesn't really feel like it fits very well because Alice is more of the one to be in the story, not so much the one telling the story. And while Bards do a fair amount of performing, outside of singing a song about turtle soup that you learned from good old Willy Wonka, there's not a ton of performing that you're doing. So we'll ignore Bard and I can't help but be drawn to Warlock here. So let's dive into that one a little bit. As soon as you pick Warlock for your class, you get saving throws in Wisdom and Charisma, and Wisdom's gonna be super helpful for maintaining your own sanity. Also, when you choose Warlock at first level, you get to choose two skills. We're gonna pick up Arcana and Investigation, because Investigation is part of why you wound up in Wonderland in the first place. You were curious about what was going on, and you followed this rabbit down the hole. And then Arcana is just the craziness of Wonderland, just overcomes you to an extent that you are starting to understand the craziness. If you go Warlock, you get to pick an otherworldly patron right away. And we have a few good choices. So in both the Tim Burton movie and the video game, you have access to the Vorpal Blade. It's brought up in the Alice in Wonderland books as you slay Kalu Kaleo Frabjus Day. Granted, in the video game, it's more of a big ass butcher's knife and in the Tim Burton movie it's more of a legitimate sword but that did make me want to lean towards Hexblade. That was until I thought about it a little more. Only these two versions really focus on the access to that blade. Most of the rest the blade isn't 
so much an integral part as much, so I think there's a better choice as far as an otherworldly patron. With the overall depiction of Wonderland and all the crazy creatures you interact with, I can't help but think of the Arch Fae, because this whole Wonderland world feels like a land of the Fae. Whether you want that Archfey patron to be the Cheshire Cat, or the White Queen, or any of the random characters that you run into, I mean, it could even be the Caterpillar, or the Mad Hatter. All of them work, and it's really just what kind of flavor you want. The Archfey gets some additional spells to choose from, and you get Fey presents. This, I kind of like to play with as an idea for how you're manipulating Wonderland a little bit to your own needs. Because it's not like your entire D&D campaign is necessarily going to be focused in Wonderland. So if you can bring Wonderland to you a little bit, it's kind of fun to play with. So this allows you to project that fearsome presence of the Fae and all of the craziness, especially in the American McGee version, forcing people in a 10-foot cube to become frightened of you as an action. As you level up in Warlock, you also get to choose some Eldritch Invocations, which we will cover all of those later, and you get to choose a Pact Boon. I was tempted to choose Pack of the Chain, and then you try and play up the Cheshire Cat being with you, but really the Cheshire Cat doesn't really serve you. You're more at their whim. And as we already covered with choosing our patron, there's a chance you're completely making a deal with them as well, so it's not like they would listen to you very much. So instead, I would choose Pact of the Blade. This will give you access to the Vorpal Blade that you can utilize whether you're in American McGee's version, or the Tim Burton version, or whatever the case may be. And this is especially useful because you don't actually have to be proficient in the weapon that you choose if it's already magical. So you can create a weapon that is something that you are proficient with and you can pretend that's a Vorpal Blade, or if you come across a magic weapon later that you're not proficient in that weapon type already, you can perform a ritual to turn it into your packed weapon and then you can use it as if you were proficient with it. It is a bit of tricky wording, but that's generally how it's understood at most tables. Then, as you continue to level up, you get the abilities from being a patron of the Archfey, Misty Escape. This is super helpful for replicating the American McGee version where you can kind of teleport into butterflies and warp to another place. This also makes you invisible for a second, but that's not quite as spot on. Then you can pick up Beguiling Defense, and this allows you to turn mind-affecting magic against your enemies. And that's super helpful for just defending yourself against the craziness that is Wonderland. Then my favorite feature of being an Archfey is Dark Delirium. This is like dragging someone else into Wonderland. You can plunge a creature into an illusory realm, and that creature becomes lost in this misty realm with an appearance that you choose and is just completely absent-minded of anything else going on around them. This is a great way to replicate Wonderland for somebody else, but it doesn't really work as well for replicating it for you. So while there are a few more features which we will go over for Warlock, mostly just the spells and Mystic Arcanum, we'll focus on those a little later. The big thing is that we're going to be taking Warlock just up to level 15. Then we're going to be jumping over into a multi-class. And since we got to level 15 in Warlock, before I touch on what we're going to be multi-classing into, I really want to touch on some of the stats. So I really dashed through Warlock and I didn't want to stop at every single level because it's not really worth it, since we're going to cover all the spells and everything else at the end. So by being level 15 in Warlock, you get three ability score improvements. And for those three, I would definitely just max out my charisma and throw one more into dexterity. This will bring your charisma up to 20 and your dexterity up to 18. So now for that multi-class, we're going to be jumping over into one of the other spellcasting charisma-based classes, Sorcerer. And when you choose Sorcerer at first level, you get to pick a subclass. And just to be able to really replicate having Wonderland kind of out of control around you, we're going to choose a Wild Magic Sorcerer. This gives you access to the Wild Magic Surge table. The DM can really decide how much this comes into play, and I think that's great for really mixing in Alice. Because you don't entirely control Wonderland, it just kind of 
of affects you and the world around you. This does everything from transporting you to the astral plane, which could be interpreted as Wonderland, to casting confusion centered on yourself, which seems a pretty damn spot on. Or if you roll an 11 or a 12 on the magic surge, you get to roll a d10 and your height changes by number of inches equal to the roll. If it's odd, you shrink. If it's even, you grow. Or similarly, if you roll a 93 or a 94 on the wild magic surge table, your size will increase by one size category for the next minute. There's also plenty of positive effects that can happen, but those are more the fun ones. I mean, there's even spawning a unicorn into existence or going full Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and turning you into a potted plant until the start of your next turn. I really love how chaotic this is and it really fits with the overall build. And frankly, I've been at a table where somebody plays a wild magic sorcerer and it's so much fun with all of the chaos that happens. So we'll take sorcerer all the way to level five, maxing out this overall build. And as you do that, you also get access to meta magic. Meta magic allows you to alter your spells in convenient or interesting ways. And I'll touch on that along with the spells, but first, since we hit level five in sorcerer, before we jump into anything else, I really want to cover the one last ability score improvement you get from these few levels. And since we're just a little bit away from maxing out our decks, let's just do that and bring our dexterity to 20. So now that we have all the stats out of the way, it's time to jump into the spells, cantrips, incantations, and even the meta magic. We'll find the best way to mix it, but let's jump into the warlock cantrips and spells first. So obviously we have to get the tried and true Eldritch Blast. It's a absolute staple of the warlock class, and the best way we can use this to replicate something from a type of media that Alice shows up in, when it comes to Alice Madness Returns, you have the Pepper Grinder, and it's kind of used like a minigun. So as Eldritch Blast levels up, you get more and more shots that blast out. And this can help replicate the minigun factor. And we can really boost up the use of our Eldritch Blast, especially as it levels up and really turn it into more of an Eldritch machine gun. So first things first, we gotta pick up Agonizing Blast from the Eldritch Invocations. This allows us to add our charisma modifier to every single blast that comes out, which by the time you hit max level, you're gonna have four beams that come out as your Eldritch Blast. So that means that once your charisma is maxed out, you're getting plus five to each of those. So you get 1d10 for each blast plus five. Then if you mix in your meta magic, you can really turn it into more of a machine gun. So if we pick up Quicken spell from the meta magic list, we can use two sorcery points to change the the casting time to a bonus action so we can actually cast eldritch blast twice this means that you get eight beams coming out from your eldritch blast that you cast twice and you get a plus five to each of those beams so that means on average you're dealing about 88 damage in a turn just from really unloading those eldritch blasts and if you completely somehow manage to roll super lucky and get maximized damage, you wind up unloading 120 damage just from using a couple cantrips. Then the only other cantrip I would really worry about is Mind Sliver. It's one of the few mental related spells and that's kind of the whole idea behind Wonderland and all of its craziness. Then as far as actual spells to pick up from the Warlock list, the very first spell I wanna cover is Hex. It has some minimal damage, but it stacks pretty well with our Eldritch Blast that we already chose because for each beam that hits, it triggers some of the damage from Hex. And if we mix that into the Eldritch Machine Gun idea that we talked about earlier, it will add another 32 damage on average to that whole double casting of Eldritch Blast or 48 damage maximized. That means on average you can deal 120 damage just from casting a couple cantrips and having your hex active, or if it's maximized, you wind up with 168, 
which is pretty damn good. As for other spells, I would definitely grab Hypnotic Pattern. This is kind of like smoking with the caterpillar and letting out sort of crazy designs. You can also throw in something like Synaptic Static, Confusion, or Mental Prison. All of these work very interesting ways. Also, I definitely would not forget about grabbing Misty Step. I know it's kind of covered with being the Archfey patron, but to really be able to use it as much as you'd like, I would grab Misty Step and then later upgrade it to Far Step because Far Step allows you to continuously use what is essentially Misty Step over and over again while only using one spell slot instead of using a spell slot every single cast. Then if you really want to dive into some of the Mystic Arcanum you can get while being a Warlock, I would look at possibly grabbing Arcane Gate at 6th level. It's kind of like recreating a portal similar to walking through the Looking Glass, but you could, like I said, use something like Mental Prison, it's just whatever you find more useful. The seventh level spell I would grab from Mystic Arcanum is Plane Shift. That is the most direct way that you're going to be able to recreate going to Wonderland, and it's kind of hard to ignore that as a possibility for a spell. Then at eighth level, it's kind of whatever you want. Demiplane is interesting to play around with because it kind of creates this weird extra dimensional box that you can go into, but if the door closes behind you, you're just trapped there. Or you can go with Feeble Mind because everybody in Wonderland kind of doesn't seem to have all their wits about them, and I think that fits a little better. So for the 8th level spell from Mystic Arcanum, which is the last you would get from being a warlock at level 15, I would definitely stick with Feeble Mind. Also, the last spell I really want to grab from being a warlock is Shatter. I know this is kind of a weird thing to grab, but in Alice Madness Returns, you get this clockwork bomb. And the best way to replicate this is with some sort of explosive spell. And we don't really have an easy way to grab Fireball, which is my go-to. So I think the best backup is going to be Shatter. Then before we jump into the Sorcerer spells, I want to cover some of the invocations. Obviously we already mentioned you're going to get Agonizing Blast, but to really round out Alice, we need a few more. I'm not going to go through all seven invocations that you need because you can kind of make it fit with whatever your general playstyle is, but just to make sure we cover our bases for the overall Alice build, we do also want to make sure we pick up Thirsting Blade. This allows you to get extra attack as you're attacking with the Vorpal Blade. Improved Pack Weapon, so that way your Vorpal Blade just hits a little better. Since we already grabbed the spell Hex, we're definitely going to grab Maddening Hex, that way, you know, everyone goes a little mad in Wonderland. And then, as far as our last invocation, we're going to grab Eldritch Sight. So this will give you a hint of what's underneath the surface, and that's part of what Wonderland really is. This allows you to cast Detect Magic at will, and in the American McGee and Alice Madness Returns, when you go to a small size, you can see things that other people can't, and I think it kind of feels like Detect Magic, and you still have a couple invocations to play around with and just make it your own. Now let's jump into the Sorcerer spells. While only being level 5 in Sorcerer, we get to know 6 spells up to a third level spell slot. And they don't mix well with being a warlock because warlock spell slots are very unique as you only get a few of them and they refill on a short rest and they don't technically count as normal spell slots. So they are a totally separate pool and we just have to keep that in mind. So for the six spells I would grab for a sorcerer, we would grab shield to replicate the Umbrella from the Alice Madness Returns, Featherfall to replicate the dress that seems to save Alice in pretty much every possible depiction of the story. Then we're going to grab Mirror Image just because obviously we're going to grab Mirror Image. The whole through the looking glass thing is kind of hard to avoid. And then there's absolutely no way we can possibly avoid in large reduce. I mean, it is one of the principal ideas behind every idea and concept of Alice in Wonderland. The whole eat me, drink me thing is just too spot on to possibly ignore grabbing this spell. Then the last two things I would grab are Crown of Madness, just to really lean into the craziness of Wonderland. And then in Alice, Madness Returns, you have this ability when things get really dire called Hysteria. 
It allows you to move around really quickly and attack much more frequently. So to replicate this, I would just grab haste. I was really tempted to try and throw in some barbarian just to try and allocate hysteria to rage, but that seemed like a bit of a stretch, so I didn't want to go that far. And now since we're kind of wrapped up with all of the spells and invocations and even some of the meta magic, I feel like there's at least one more meta magic that most people should take, and that's twin spell. It's kind of hard to avoid how good this is, especially when you can twin cast haste. If you want other meta magic later, you can grab whatever you want. It's not like anything fits or doesn't fit with this build. I just think that having quicken spell and twin spell is an absolute must. And there's one last thing I really just have to touch on. So I kept bringing up the Vorpal Blade, and there's actually a Vorpal Blade in D&D as a legitimate item. It's called the Vorpal Sword, and it is absolutely legendary. I mean, that's actually what it's classified as. You gain plus three bonus to your attack and damage rolls with this sword, so you don't actually need your improved pack weapon if you can manage to find this, which will give you another invocation to play around with. This weapon ignores resistance to slashing damage, which is somewhat beneficial because there are quite a few enemies as you get higher up that are resistant to normal types of damage, and it has a unique little bonus. When you attack a creature that has at least one head with this weapon, and you roll a 20 on the attack roll, which means you get a critical hit, you cut off one of the creature's heads. The creature dies if it can't survive without the lost head, and although the creature is immune to this effect if it's immune to slashing damage, or if it doesn't have a head or need a head, or even if it has legendary actions, which means this usually doesn't work on a boss, and the GM also has a discretion to say that maybe Maybe the creature is too big to have its head chopped off like this, but it's still a pretty brutally intense feature to have. Even if your dungeon master decides, no, I can't allow you to just chop its head off and end this big fight right away, or if you're using it against a boss, any of those, you still get an extra 68 slashing damage added on, just to really boost up this crit, and that is pretty damn powerful. Granted, it is a legendary weapon, and it gives you plus three, so it's going to take a while before you wind up tracking down one of these. It can take the form of a greatsword, longsword, or scimitar. If you wanted it to be a greatsword or a longsword, just make sure that you put points into strength instead of dexterity. But if you have it as a scimitar, it at least has the finesse property, so you can use your dexterity just as we built Alice out already. So with the Vorpal Blade taken care of, I think we pretty well covered most depictions of Alice in Wonderland. Whether it's from Disney, some crazy TV movie, the Tim Burton version, or American McGee's Alice Madness Returns or any of the video games. I know this build is a little all over the place and I tried to streamline it a little bit so that way it didn't feel like we were all going down the rabbit hole together. But I am very curious to know what everybody's favorite Mad Hatter is because I have a personal preference and I think he is constantly overlooked for his performance as the Mad Hatter because frankly, the very best depiction of the Mad Hatter is from Martin Short. It was so crazy and over the top while at the same time just, I don't know, just feeling so good. I loved that depiction and that entire TV movie was so insane and I loved it. Anyways, I'm curious to know your thoughts, so let me know in the comments down below. That's even how I was recommended this build in the first place. Smug Alice recommended it, and it seemed like such an interesting build, there was no way I was going to ignore it. And even Nodishan chimed in after he saw that my patrons on Patreon had voted, and it was a possible recommendation, and he was talking about how he was kind of excited about the idea as well. So I hope everybody enjoyed it. If you want to help vote on future builds, get character sheets for any of my builds, or tons of other perks, you can be just as freaking awesome as these people. They're my patrons over on Patreon, and they help support me to make this stuff. You can find a link to my Patreon in the description down below. Even if you can't join my Patreon, it still really helps to leave a comment, or just subscribe so you don't miss out on future builds. 
then if you made it all the way to the end of this build, let me know by hitting that like button. I'm hoping you have a very merry on birthday and roll at least three nat 20s on your next D&D session. Until next time, don't get too lost down the rabbit hole, but still have plenty of fun in Wonderland.